Hello, I'm Judy Bailey. Many of us are shocked when we're confronted with images of the harsh reality of life in the developing world, but few of us act on our feelings. Tauranga-based mother and lawyer Denise Arnold saw images of Cambodian children that so disturbed her she knew she had to do something about it. With no political or religious affiliations and absolutely no experience in the developing world, she went to Cambodia and what a difference she's made. This is Denise's story. I've never been a person that can watch um, horror movies or read about, you know, terrible things that happen to people. But in 2006, I read an article about kids in Cambodia and how you could buy them on a weekly basis and, you know, once you finish with them, just return them like a bike or a car or something. And that really impacted on me. It is not okay to sleep with kids, whether you're a local or a tourist. It's actually a crime. I did also, at that time, start to think that the world was a really terrible place. And I said to my mother-in-law at the time, you know, the, the world's it's such a dark place and I just don't think that's the, there's anything that you can do about it. And she said that she remembered Eleanor Roosevelt once saying that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. I first came to Cambodia in 2007. I hadn't travelled to Asia before and I hadn't travelled on my own without my family, so it was a big moment for me. My family were really supportive. I think they probably thought it might all end in tears and were waiting for the frantic phone call, but the first email I sent them was, I'm having a great time and I feel, strange enough, that this is where I belong. Probably the first time that she mentioned going to Cambodia, I thought she was a little bit crazy, maybe going through a midlife crisis or something. Would you say that we were a bit shocked? Oh, I didn't really, I didn't really know what to expect. I was like, what are you? I didn't even know. Where are you, why are you going there? Didn't even know where Cambodia was. Yeah, I thought it was in Africa. Cambodia is a country which needs a bit of help, and to some extent, we stood by while it was being carpet bombed, and we stood by while Pol Pot waved to us on our television screens, and I remember that as a child and I actually don't think I can stand by any longer. It seems overpowering, it seems that we are insignificant, and in reality, we're not. So, when I came back from Cambodia and told my friends and family about how strongly I felt about this, a lot of them actually got it, and many of them had been looking for the mechanism for them to make a difference. So establishing a trust enabled me to be able to say, happy to do this on my own, but if you want to join me, this is how we can do it together. In many developing countries, girls really pretty much get the raw deal. If there's not enough money in a family to send both the son and daughter to school, they'll send the son. If there's work to be done around the home, it's the daughter that's expected to do it. Girls are important because if you educate a girl, you educate her entire family. She can raise her kids and they'll get an education as well. So she's just so critical. If you don't educate a girl, she kind of drops off the planet, uh, sometimes literally. Much less than 50% girls going through primary school. Many of them don't finish primary school, some don't even start. So we really needed to bring that level of kids at primary school back and give the girls a chance to actually go to school and complete primary school. You know that for every one of you, there is somebody in New Zealand who cares a lot about you and they want you to plan to have, do great things with your life. Yeah. I'm very, very happy that you have support me. I've been to see Sapir once before, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, what's changed. 
When I visited her, she had um, both parents away working and she was about 11. So I'm just thinking that a child such as Sapir, I would consider her an economic orphan and very much at risk. So I'm wanting to make sure that she's okay. And also the person that's sponsoring her is wanting to let her know that she can dream big and aspire to go to university. And I think that's a really valuable message for these girls who've had no hope and who haven't had the, um, even the concept that they could succeed at school. Does Sophia have any idea what she would like to do when she gets older? Um, yeah, I want to be a nurse. A nurse? That's good. Oh. Sophia lives here on her own during the day. She comes home to nobody and that's quite disturbing, a girl of her age. She's, um, she's got no one that's looking out for her and she's exactly the vulnerable kind of girl that we're trying to protect. My social conscience has probably always been there. I think as a kid I've really always considered the underdog and tried to help kids that were less fortunate without really realising what I was doing. I think I had an extremely fortunate childhood. My parents both worked, my mother was a nurse, my father a teacher, and we were what I would consider to be quite privileged, a middle class New Zealand kind of way, but you know, we'd be going out for meals as a family, went on holidays, my parents built a caravan, I learnt to snow ski and water ski and stuff like that, so I think that I was extremely fortunate. I don't think when you start off on a quest as such, there's any one defining moment where you take a step. But when I came in 2007 and looked around, it seemed apparent that the long-term solutions were the ones we really needed, and education is the key to breaking that poverty cycle. Poverty and ignorance is what leads to trafficking and despair, so that was my, my in. When we first set out, we didn't have any money, basically, and I relied on the goodwill of the people here. And I met Suan and Sam, who were prepared to work tirelessly as volunteers for us. The way to form a close bond and to get success with these schools is to work in schools where they have already got strong relationships with the community. So to start with, we supported a school which was from their home village. They knew everybody there, they knew what was going on, and the lines of communication were very, very strong. At this stage, we're supporting eight schools, seven primary and one secondary, and two teachers training colleges in the Kompot and Takeo provinces. The teachers here had no teaching capacity. They don't know how to teach. They've told us that. They don't know how to teach, they have nothing to teach with, and they don't know what they're meant to be teaching. So we've established teacher workshops, which isn't particularly exciting on the outside of it, but when you walk into a classroom and you see a teacher actively teaching and engaging the children, reading them stories, using their materials from the workshop, I think that is massive. That makes me feel so proud of them. Pretty focused on their reading, aren't they? <laughs> which is a good sign. It's actually the bit that will pay dividends over generations, having teachers that can teach. I've actually wondered how Denise can go into a country like Cambodia and have such an effect, but she just seems to be able to cut through it. I don't know why, but it happens. She's energetic, enthusiastic, high-powered, genuine. Um, I could go on for many more, many more attributes, but those are sort of some of them that jump out. Looking into this classroom, I can see that the kids are working together in clusters and they are working cooperatively. So they're helping each other to learn and they're sharing ideas, which is a new teaching technique that we've seen develop. 
also they have teaching materials on the desk, which they wouldn't have had previously. Each child's got a textbook, which we didn't used to have, and the teacher is actively moving around the classroom, monitoring progress, encouraging them, correcting things. That's a class that's working. Part of our regular monthly support includes stationery or uniforms for the kids and so today we have some stationery, um, just some notebooks and pens so once we've had a look around this classroom and kind of appreciated the changes they've made, we'll be handing them out to the kids. There are issues with the government in Cambodia. There is a lot of corruption and there's a lot of aid money that goes missing. So the first thing is that none of our money goes through any government channels. We manage it all directly. Okay, all got one? Yes, mate. Good work hard, boy. It took me ages to figure out how to move the money over here. Eventually the light went on, it took a while, but I established an account in New Zealand and set up a lot of sub-accounts, got FPOS cards for all of them and carried them over to Cambodia which means that I can control the money at my desk through internet banking and I can see where the money has come in or gone out and no more than what I put in can go out on any given day. So it's very tight. So there's one. First time I handed out a school uniform, the little girl that I gave it to was shaking. She was absolutely overwhelmed when she took the uniform. She clasped it to her chest and then started crying. And I thought, oh, hang on, you know, I've got to hold this together. I'm the only person here for all these people to look at. And please don't make me lose it. So that was really, really hard. It's emotionally exhausting sometimes. You're welcome. Excellent. Well, I think I'm quite an analytical person. And as a lawyer, we tend to be a bit perhaps cynical and sceptical about some things. So I do apply those sort of viewpoints to what Denise does. And my support really is based upon the trust being an effective trust. The cause resonates with me really because it's so fundamentally simple and easy to see what it achieves. I think there are complications with aid systems. I think there's a big aid industry. A lot of people make a lot of money over there, but this is very different. I try not to get too close to the children. I feel as though my role is to kind of be their voice and their hope and their um, decision maker and try and lead them forward rather than to sit and kind of have fun with them. I just don't think I can cope with the one-to-one -one personality issues that would come from that. say your mum's so busy like how does she have time to fit everything in that kind of thing but it's a lot different looking in from the outside to what we experience like we all get involved as a family in Cambodia it's kind of part of how we are just giving each teacher's college trainee some toothpaste shampoo a toothbrush and soap because they live on an income of about two dollars fifty a month which is pretty much below, well, below sustainable level. And so this is our way of kind of giving them a bit of a boost. It's really a part of our life and it's just come to be like that. It's just everyday life. Cambodia yeah. is just part of it, I it's guess. the third child at the table. Third child at the table, yeah. So when I think about the hundreds of items I have in my bathroom, I feel really quite embarrassed. But this will last them months and they are very excited to receive it. So. This is a really big deal for them. I just think it's a real contrast with my life at home. Not a good one. Through you, we can improve the entire economy of Cambodia and the education system within it. You can inspire and lead these children to achieve great things. Her pace of life over there is so fast, really. Now, Denise, in addition to working in the law office and um, doing the work in the trust, is doing a full-time Massey course. She's actually a full-time student. And she was battling along in the back of a van, in probably about 40 degrees, trying to type a Massey essay, I guess on her iPad. 
and still and and while everyone else is talking to her. So just astounding, really. I was looking at um, our solar power, Sam. We probably need to know a little bit more about the experience that Ong Chom is having with its solar power, yes. and if it is successful then we would try and use that model for some of our other more remote schools. You know, yesterday we didn't finish till well after eight, and in fact, we went through the list. I was still about halfway through the list. It's exhausting sometimes. It's also incredibly fulfilling. And back in New Zealand, I know my head is often really full of the issues here and the people I care so much about. And they've been left behind dealing with all the issues and carrying on with the struggle. Sometimes I can see opportunities that they can't, and as a result, I can achieve a huge amount in the time that I'm here that they would really struggle with. 233 children, so this school would probably cost about 500 US a month to run, wouldn't it? So that's, it's not unachievable, it's just, um, uh, you know, we need to pick it up and get it supported as a whole. We can't afford to take it on, but by that we need to find somebody who will help the school. Yeah. I think they deserve a bit of a hand. Yeah. Mm. Okay. After the genocide and, you know, decades of war, I think there's a lot that's um, been damaged here in their psyche and there's a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. I think if you scratch below the surface, you'll find that there's people that are still really struggling to actually crawl back out of that. You would think that in a community which is basically a farming community, they'd know how to grow food, but they don't. They've lost a lot of those schools during the genocide. They also lost the ability to work together as a community and the family and community ties were broken. What we found as a result of these gardens is that the families are getting involved in growing the food and that the mothers are coming along and getting involved in the weeding and the community, sense of community is developing. So it's got some real spin-offs in that respect as well. Every time I come here, I think I have, I understand the country and I've kind of figured it out and I figure it's just much more complex than I ever imagined it would be. We solve one problem and we end up dealing with another consequence. For example, we get 80 young women finishing primary school in our sponsorship program and they go into secondary school. And that's an amazing achievement until the secondary school principal says, we've got no more room in our secondary school and we actually need to build another building. And you go, okay, well, you know, that's a price of success and we'll just have to take that one on the chin. It's definitely had a massive impact on the family. Like everyone is so involved. It's quite incredible actually how involved our family's gotten it. Even my younger cousins, they've fundraised to give kids in Cambodia footballs at school and sporting equipment because that's what they're interested in in New Zealand. So they kind of want the kids in Cambodia to have that experience as well. I'm really pleased that my girls get it, get what I'm doing. Um, they've both been to Cambodia and they understand. And when I hear them come back to me about something that they've heard about their friends complaining about and go, yeah, well, first world problems, I think that's pretty cool because that says a lot to me. Excellent, well done. Like our grandparents are very involved. Like it's all they talk about. Is that you have a family dinner and Nana will be all like, oh, I'm not going to mention the C word, not going to talk about Cambodia. And she's fine for a little bit, but then the dam breaks and no one can stop her and she's just <laughs> spurting Cambodia everywhere. It just comes out of her. It's ridiculous. I am really conscious that I put a lot of time into Cambodia and sometimes I'm not really present. I'm thinking about problems I'm trying to solve or achievements that, have, um, that are imminent. And so I am really conscious I haven't got the time and energy for my family I used to have. In a way, I think with teenagers, they probably appreciate not having your beady eye on them quite so much. 
but there have been moments where I've had to go away just before a birthday or I've missed something that I really wanted to be here for and it's been at that personal cost of the family. I'm their advocate and I've got to be their hope. Six classrooms pumps out a lot of kids every year. And I stood back and went, heck, that's us. We did that. That's just, yeah, that's big. Hmm. Yeah. I'm very proud of her. I think she's achieving great things. And when you go into the villages, um, there's small schools, you just can't help having, yeah, being struck by it. I've always felt as though I had a task that I had to perform in my life, some kind of a calling, nothing grand and um, nothing that was going to stand out in the world scheme of things. But I just had to do it. And so somehow or another, I have found my place. And I love being here. I love doing what I do. Part of a much bigger effort than just me. Standing in front of those children, it's a very strange feeling because we have the power to make such a difference in their life to transform their life. Why wouldn't you want to be part of that?